um, after the presentation. Uh, so you can watch and listen to the recording at your safest convenience. This does qualify for one CEU. To earn your CEU, you must participate for at least 45 minutes and you'll receive proof of attendance uh, within one day after the presentation that you attended so that you can enter that into your uh, recertification profile. There'll be time for questions at the end, so please enter your questions in the chat and we'll have them addressed after our presenters. And so for our presenters today, we have Dr. Marilyn Bull, who's a neurode neurodevelopmental pediatrician at the Riley Hospital for Children at Indiana University Health in Indianapolis. She serves on the faculty at the Indiana University Medical Center, where she currently is the Morris Green Professor, Professor Emeritus of Pediatrics. She's also the co-medical director of the Automotive Safety for Children program and National Center for Safe Transportation of Children with Special Needs, who we, who we all know if we've worked with children with special needs, that um, it's a wonderful program that was started there and expanded throughout the country. She also represents the American Academy of Pediatrics on the National Child Passenger Safety Board. And we also have with us today, Marsha French, who is the program director of the Automotive Safety Program and the Nas National Center for the Safe Transportation of Children with Special Health Care Needs at Indiana University School of Medicine. So she and Dr. Bull are colleagues and work together on the excellent program. Uh, she's also, Marsha is also a child passenger safety technician instructor and a master certified health education specialist. Uh, and just again, a reminder to enter your questions in the chat box so we can address them at the end. And with that, I will turn it over to our presenters. Thank you, Jim, and welcome. I'm so delighted that all of you are here and uh, to share with us this topic that we hope will be very helpful and um, provide the principles for addressing kids that you indeed may see in your day-to-day -day, um, involvement in child passenger safety. Um, It's not letting me move the slides to. Dr. Bullet says it's waiting for you to control the screen. Well, I'm pushing on control the screen. So I don't know. Let me see. Just to confirm, can everyone see the slides or the first slide? Okay, thank you. Under view options, it says give up remote control. I don't want to do that, right? Correct. If you um, click on, oh, it looks like you just took over. <laughs> okay, <laughs> let me see. Nope. Marsha, you may have to move the slides. Okay. So these are our objectives. We really, um, we want to start by defining special healthcare needs among children that, that with features that can impact their safe vehicle travel and discuss specific cases that we have encountered that involve children with special health needs and identify possible solutions in um, applying the good, better, best for safe transportation, and then review available resources for um, where you can get additional information. Next. Um, this is a longstanding definition that many of you are familiar with um, of children with special needs 
And they are those who have had increased risk for a chronic physical developmental behavior or emotional condition and who require health care and services of a type or amount beyond that generally required by children. Next. Our, our surveys and evaluations have shown that in the years 2017 to 2018, there are approximately 13.6 million or 18.5% of the children in the United States ages zero to 17 that have met this definition of special health care. And that means that one in four households in this country has one or more children with special health care needs. One in four children have had functional limitations and one in five were consistently or significantly impaired with their health condition. Next. There are many challenges that are encountered when, trans when identifying um, resources for uh, children with special needs and specifically lack of awareness of the nature of the problems, lack of resources, and then limited research and data, as those are um, issues that are so common and difficult to, um, and expensive to uh, identify. This was all published um, back in um, 2008. Other issues include funding, um, for I have resources for the, that might be important and helpful. Um, Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Staff Gender 213, of course, does not address um, children or even adults across the lifespan. And there are state law exemptions for in some settings for children with special health care needs that really aren't necessary. And then school bus transportation, which is adds another whole element of complexity for um, appropriate resources. And I just want to say that um, school bus transportation is part of an IEP for any child with special needs. So should be part of an IEP for every child with special needs. So we can help families um, in that respect. Next slide. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Marsha. Apologies, it takes me a second to find the unmute button. So that means, um, based on the statistics that Dr. Bull just shared, one in four households have a child with a special health care need, that you are going to see children with special health care needs at a car seat clinic. Um, maybe you haven't yet, and maybe you have but the likelihood is going to increase um, as time goes on and as um, early diagnosis and early interventions um, really start to um, move forward in all communities, not just in larger high resource communities. So, and I really love this picture. This is from our annual car seat clinic um, this year at Ivy Tech Community College. And um, it was a really fun, amazing day that we got to help families. So when we're thinking about a car seat clinic, specifically, we want to really think about um, what the curriculum taught us. So thinking about the National Child Passenger Safety Certification Curriculum and really thinking about what good, better, best means. Because not every single time that we are working with a family and a caregiver with a child, they're not always going to let us get to that best option. And sometimes we just can't because of the resources that we have um, at that time, at that place. So when we're thinking about good, better, best, thinking about how do we get to good when we are working at a car seat clinic and whether this is with a child um, that is typically developing or a child with special health care needs. So thinking about meeting that minimum manufacturer instructions and meeting the height and weight restrictions and age restrictions for some car seats, as well as meeting your state law. So super important to make sure we're re reaching that bare minimum at good. Then we move on to better. So 
the caregiver is following the manufacturer instructions. They're going to um, above the minimum height and weight restrictions for the car seat, but not exceeding them and they are meeting the state law. And then the best are those caregivers that are continuing to wait until that child reaches the car seat maximum height and weight limitations for the car seat based on how it's used. So whether it's used rear facing or forward facing with a harness or a booster seat, meeting and exceeding that state law. So even thinking about how we keep um, kiddos are, that are in that eight to nine year old range, um, whether again, they're typically developing or if they are a child with special health care needs, how we keep them in harness seats longer or booster seats as appropriate before we transition them to the adult seat belt. And again, this is just referencing the National Child Passenger Certification Training. Also included in the training is we really need to remember that when it's possible, we need to keep children with special health care needs in conventional car seats. That's the best practice. They're widely available, they are less expensive, and your average Walmart or Target or Meyer or wherever um, there is a location in your area car seats are available. Um, some of the special or adaptive child restraints are very hard to obtain um, and are very expensive as probably many of you know. So best practice is to keep them in a conventional car seat as long as possible. So here's where we're going to transition into talking about some of the cases that we have experienced both at car seat check clinics and then also in a more um, medical clinic setting. The first case we're gonna talk about is actually a case that we had um, at one of our National Child Passenger Safety Certification Training events. And it was in a county just north of Indianapolis. So it's, um, a, it's still a, a large area in Indianapolis. It was conducted by appointment only. So we have ever since COVID, um, so for two years now, we have been working under the philosophy of using an appointment-based clinic for our national certification training, car seat checkup event. And that just really helps us plan a little better for making sure we have enough instructors and also making sure that we have enough car seats. Um, and if we're going to be replacing car seats that we have the appropriate restraint based on the child's age, weight, and height. One of the assistant instructors reviewed all of the weight, height, and ages prior to the clinic, and that assistant instructor was me. And when I looked at the list, there was a two-year-old that was 70 pounds on our appointment list. And I thought, hmm, we don't have a restraint that we keep on hand that will accommodate this this child in this case. So I asked the other instructor that had made the appointments and she said, oh, I just think that maybe he didn't really, like mom really didn't know the weight of the child. So how many of you have ever heard that before? Oh, they don't really know the weight, we're just guesstimating. So. At the arrival of the clinic, the tech candidates, because again, this was during a certification class, fun. See, look, I have some comments here. I'm reading the chat. I probably shouldn't be, but th this probably happens more often than we know. Um, so at arrival at the clinic, the tech candidates had recorded age of four. So I'm not sure where the discrepancy is yet, but they had an age of four and the weight was 68 pounds, child was 37 inches tall. The child was riding in a Graco Extend to fit, um, and the the child could not actually. It was buckled, but it was so tight on on this little guy's um, thighs, so it it could barely be buckled. It definitely couldn't be tightened because of the way that it it fit on the child. Um, and when they were buckling the chest clip, it 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 was so it was putting so much pressure there that it wouldn't stay buckled. Um, it was really interesting. So we were starting to put the child in a high back booster because we were like, oh, he's four. But one of the other instructors that was working with the family um, that eventually pulled me over to this lane determined that the child was only two. Um, I think 
there was some developmental, like the, the child spoke really well and had a really great vocabulary and socially interacted really well with the adults. So I think that's why they thought he was four, but he was really only two. The experienced instructor team. So during this car seat clinic, we were really lucky because we had uh, two stack instructors at this car seat clinic and another instructor that had taken stack. And we had someone that worked for the Department of Child Services that was an instructor as well. So we had a really great experienced power team, um, but we still had to figure out what we were going to do because we weren't sure what we were going to do because we didn't have very many resources during that car seat check. So we discussed how to best serve this kiddo um, and how we were going to keep them safe while traveling. So how do we do that? How do we get to good, better, best? So first, really, honestly, we couldn't get to good because we did not have a car seat that went over 65 pounds with the harness and we didn't have a booster seat that didn't have a minimum age of four years old. So there, there was our first challenge. What were we going to do? So we didn't have a restraint on hand that would meet the weight, height, and age requirements. We tried two different conventional restraints just for size to see if the harness would fit. One of the conventional car seat harnesses actually fit and we could tighten. So we decided that we were gonna call the manufacturer of this specific car seat and see what they said. When I talked to the manufacturer, the manufacturer gave very, very limited permission to use the restraint, given that the instructor double checked the installation with a lap and shoulder belt and a tether to use the restraint in the harness mode. When I was actually discussing with this person, with the car seat manufacturer advocate, this person mentioned, well, if we think of good, better, best, having a child restrained in a harness at two years old is going to be better than putting them in a booster seat at two years old with a lap and shoulder belt. Um, and then also being restrained is better than not being restrained at all. Um, this was a hard one and it is hard for us to swallow as technicians because we, we want to be able to provide them and we want to be able to meet that good at least. And that's where our struggle was. However, we had ideas for this family. So we scheduled a follow up with the family and we were going to provide them with a better option for travel. So we were gonna provide them with a ride safer travel vest. I spoke with the manufacturer, um, ride safer manufacturer with Vera. We discussed kind of the height weight um, restrictions for this child and the age. She gave me um, information on this ride safer vest and it gave me which size would work and talked about the extendable panel. I also, worked with EasyOn and discussed the um, case with EasyOn as well. And we discussed that this could be an option for the child, but we also wanted to get measurements to make sure that this would fit appropriately for the child because we didn't want to buy a restraint that wouldn't work for the child. We had one more option. So we got lucky and we're super lucky here because in, in our Indianapolis metro area, we have a, a lot of great resources. So we just happened to be having a safe travel for all children class. And so we invited the family to participate in the family appointments or the patient appointments during that course. And the family agreed. Um, so the child was brought in during the class and had an OT evaluation during the Safe Travel for All Children course. The child participated in the evaluation and car seat appointment. And we actually were able to give this child a loner Roosevelt while the child was having an adaptive restraint ordered. This is not something that happens all over the country. We hope that everyone has these resources, but that's how we got to best. Did it happen overnight? No, but it happened um, within about a month and three days is, is what I calculated it at. So that was our best case scenario, getting that child in an appropriate adaptive child restraint after the class, getting them almost to good during that car seat checkup. 
the next case that we're going, um, yes, a Roosevelt, I, it looks like there's a question in the chat. The Roosevelt is an adaptive child restraint that has a higher weight and height restrictions. So it goes up to 115 pounds with the harness and it goes up to 62 inches for the height. So apologies for not clarifying that. Case study two. So this is a child with a gibbous deformity. Uh, the child is unable to sit in a conventional car seat due to uh, spina bifida. And I have a picture on the next slide uh, for those of you that are not familiar with what a gibbous deformity is. Spina bifida is a birth defect of the spine resulting from an abnormal um, closure of the neural tubes. And it forms really early in the central nervous system. This formation um, is bone, muscle, and skin around the spinal cord. And for this child that we are specifically talking about, the deformity formed and hardened in the lower back well after birth, and they weren't a good candidate for surgery for multiple years due to some other risk that the child um, was, had. So the child arrived in a hope car bed lying on the stomach. And this from birth, the child had been riding on stomach and the physician really did not want the child to be riding on the stomach anymore. The child was 20 months old, 28 inches and 18.5 pounds. The child was also at the higher height limitations. So the hope car bed goes up to 29 inches. So they were at that high um, end for height and are going to outgrow the HOPE car bed. So this is the gibbous deformity. You can see it's, it's hardened bony muscle structure there on the back. And then if you've never seen a HOPE car bed, this is what a HOPE car, car bed looks like. They can ride prone, supine, and sometimes side-lying. So for this case, how do we get to good, better, best? And this was in a medical clinic. So this child was being seen by one of the specialists and then referred to our occupational therapist. And Tony's going to be helping with some Q&A here in a few minutes. But here's how um, we worked with good. So suboptimal fit in a conventional car seat. So the child really didn't have a great fit in a conventional car seat. Um, it put a lot of pressure, it was uncomfortable. The child it just, it was not optimal for this child to ride in a conventional car seat. They were really limiting travel already because of the Hope car bed and the amount of space that it takes up in a vehicle. It takes up a minimum of two spaces in a vehicle. So they were limiting travel already. Better was again in that hope car bed on stomach or right side, but again, they were outgrowing the hope car bed. So we needed to get them in a better option. We needed to find something that was going to be best for them. So this is where our OT got to work. So we were working with a family and we thought, and with a couple of other teams at Riley, and we wanted to figure out how to use a conventional car seat with addition of a manufacturer approved foam to improve positioning and comfort. So Tony was able to contact one of the manufacturers. This manufacturer had a medical waiver program. They worked with Tony directly. He ordered um, with another company, very specific foam and then they worked to cut the foam in a very certain shape. You can see in this middle picture here to help relieve and leave space for that gibbous deformity to um, be able to be comfortably in. And then you can see the kiddo here, how happy um, he is in his new car seat. We were able to purchase the conventional convertible car seat with some separate grant funding that we had to use. So that was something else that we were able to do to provide this to a family at no cost. Um, this was something that we worked with a lot of different people um, and programs both at Riley and the School of Medicine to make happen for the family. And I, I, I'm going to mention, because you guys can all see who, who the manufacturer is of this car seat, it is even flow. So Tony um, always 
we always encourage everyone to reach out to the manufacturers and it may be something, any manufacturer, not just Evenflow, but Evenflow does specifically have the medical waiver program um, and they will work with you. You just have to reach out to them and discuss it case by case issue. And now I'm gonna let Dr. Bull take over and Dr. Bull, you might still be able to control my screen and if you see the arrow down here. So thank you, um, Marsha. And I'm going to present a, one of my patient experiences that, that I think represents several um, principles. Number one, some of the challenges for children with a Down syndrome, but also challenges within the medical setting. So this is um, patient Joan was seen in the Down syndrome clinic at Riley for an initial consultative visit. She was nine years old. She weighed 53 pounds and was 45 inches tall. The parent came to the clinic with three major concerns. She is aggressive and hurts her sibling. She won't go to bed. She wakes up multiple times at night and she's hyperactive. Next slide. So her medical diagnoses that she came with were, was her medical diagnosis was not only Down syndrome, but ADHD, both inattentive and hyperactive type. And the family had requested that her care be transferred to Riley after they had been seen at two other major Down syndrome uh, centers. On clinical exam, my exam, she presented with characteristic Down syndrome features. She was socially interactive, she was verbal, and she was re very responsive to my requests in my exam, but she was noted to have a high activity level. Next slide. So as I always do, I inquired of the parent, how does Joan travel in the car? We went through all her feeding and sleep and other issues. And then um, towards the end of the visit, I made the inquiry regarding her transportation in the car. And the parent responded, oh, we use a booster seat and we don't have any problems. But being a little suspicious, I asked the parent if Joan, if they ever had problems keeping her seatbelt on. And the parent responded, oh, we only use the lap belt part because she puts the shoulder harness behind her. The parent further offered, our pediatrician said it's okay. She's restrained because she's restrained and she's in a car seat. Next slide. Well, I'm trying to be politically appropriate. I first assured the parent, this is a really very common problem in Down syndrome, which is why I knew how to ask it. But it's also a concern about Joan's best safety. And I explained the risks of not having any upper torso restraint. Um, I was able to offer a same day consultation with our specialist in safe transportation of children with special needs. And I arranged that consultation, took the time to contact to make sure they were available. And I sent her over to where um, Tony was available as she also needed some lab tests. Well, they went to the lab but they failed to arrive for the OT consultation. Next slide. Oh, we missed the slide there somehow. No, so I, I get, no, no, that's okay. We're, we're going to work on how do we get to good, better, best. Next slide. Um, I offered, so when they didn't show up, some of Tony's staff actually called the mother and offered a full assessment at a time that would be convenient for them. And mother refused to return stating she would never put a nine-year-old in a car seat with a harness. But they did agree to return for other medical and behavioral issues for follow-up um, with the consultants that I had ordered. And in terms of good, better, best, I put good <laughs> in quotations because I don't think we really ever got there, but sort of good may be that she might not be ejected if she's restrained with that lap belt. Um, sort of good 
that hopefully the concerns could be addressed at a future visit and the other consultants were aware of the issues. And I want to comment too that I'm not at all certain that that pediatrician said it's okay, she's wearing a lap belt and in a car seat, but one never knows. Um, so in the full report that went to the primary referring care provider, um, I included a discussion of booster seat use and potential alternatives. Um, and at that point, um, that was where this situation stands. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Marsha to talk about resources. We wanted to just discuss resources to keep in your toolbox or your toolkit as a child passenger safety technician, because we know that not everyone um, has resources to a stack instructor or maybe even a stack and trained technician um, and certainly may not have resources for an adaptive restraint. So we wanted to give you some resources just to one, provide more um, education or additional areas that you guys can visit. So the first um, resource that we wanted to identify was the American Academy of Pediatrics Car Seat Product Listing for 2022. This is a resource that we use probably daily in our office, but it is a great resource for technicians. It has a list of all of the conventional car seats. Um, it is available both in English and in Spanish. It goes over the rear facing convertible all in one combination and booster seats. It also has the travel vest on there, but it gives you the price range. It talks about uh, rear facing weight limits and height limitations, forward facing weight limitations and height limitations and age limitations. It also will tell you for the forward facing harness seat, um, whether you can recline it if it has any recline options for forward facing, which I know is helpful for keeping children with special health care needs in conventional car seats. And then it also lists booster weight limits, height limits, and age limits as well. There is a wonderful tool on the cert.safekids.org website. On the website, not only can you find a car seat tech in your area, but you're also able to identify whether a car seat tech or search for a car seat tech in your area that has special needs training. So you would go to the find a tech with stack training. You're gonna enter your location, so your state, um, your country, your city perhaps, and then you would check this box here that's for special needs and it will bring up just the technicians in the area that you've identified that have the special needs training. You can also visit our special needs transportation section of our website. So our website is preventinjury.pediatrics.iu.edu or if you go to preventinjury.org that still will redirect to our long website. There is a plethora of information on the website, resources including child restraint options, medical conditions. It reviews all the different types of medical conditions. We have an area that has upcoming stack trainings as well. There's news there. There's FAQs for some of the um, updated restraints um, as far as adaptive restraints. I would also stress that you advocate for hospital personnel training um, in your local area, whether it's a small rural hospital or if it's if you're in a large um, metro area. Safe Kids Worldwide, we worked with them many years ago to do a special needs transport in service for OTs, PTs, and any hospital personnel. Any certified child passenger safety technician can provide this training. It's on a website and I should have actually put the website on here instead of hyperlinking it, but I'll make sure that gets added to the chat. All of the tools that you need to teach this class are available on the website. It includes an instructor guide, a PowerPoint presentation. It has discharge checklists, sample policies, everything you would need to really go in and try to get hospital um, support in your local area. 
And then as you are thinking about planning car seat clinics, I would stress the importance of thinking about who your technician volunteers are. This always comes um, into play when you're also thinking about uh, it, the level of experience that your technicians have, but will you have anyone that's trained in special needs? That way you know if you have additional questions and maybe they just need a conventional car seat, but if they have um, questions, you know which technician you can refer them to during the event, it, what seats you're going to have available. So using booster seats that go to 120 pounds. Maybe sometimes there are ones that have a little bit of a wider seat as well. Maybe that the armrests aren't um, as high so that they can make sure that they will accommodate a variety of children. Having ride safer travel vest on hand or easy on vest, if you have the ability to do that. Again, we had additional separate funding. We were able to purchase some of these to have on hand after we had our emergency at our uh, national certification car seat checkup event. So we purchased some to have on hand at events. And I know that's not possible for every um, car seat check, but it's just something to think about. And then where can you refer to if you are unable to assist? What other resources do you have in your community where you can make sure that, hey, I, I'm not able to help. Here's where I can, what I can do today, but here's a list of resources and I can get you connected with the next level. I think that's super important when we're working a car seat check um, to make sure that we have a, a warm handoff with a family because it really does encourage the family then to follow through with the next step. Here is our contact information. We were a little bit short on time, but here's our contact information. If you have any questions, you can certainly reach out to Dr. Bull or I. Um, we will respond as soon as we can. I know Dr. Bull is very busy with her conference and CM, uh, CMU schedule, um, and we have our refresher courses here traveling around the state of Indiana, but we will answer questions as soon as we can. And Jim, I'm gonna hand it over to you. And I have a really wonderful picture here. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you, Marcia. And thank you, Anthony, for um, fielding some questions as well. Um, one of the questions that came up a little bit earlier uh, from Joe. Oh, first I wanted to acknowledge uh, Sergio and Marcella who joined us from Chile today. Thank you for joining us. Um, and a question that came up, physicians know a patient has a special need, but they don't know there's a special answer. Any tips on educating medical staff on awareness of what's, what's available? So if I can respond to that um, and, and add a little bit maybe to my talk. So when you're talking about um, providers, I think it's uh, really important that we keep our medical people in the community as informed as possible in terms of do they know they have resources? No, they may well not know. And this is why Marsha says as many technicians as can take the stack training um, is advisable, but also um, making sure that you reach out to the providers. As I mentioned, I'm not at all sure that physician said um, in my setting that this, um, that's okay, she's, she's in a car seat and you're using a lap belt. But they might have, and um, I wasn't going to, um, and would not uh, argue with that with the mother, of course, but I did make an effort to make sure that physician knew what resources were available and appropriate for this child. And I just also want to give the providers just a little bit of leeway here, having First of all, I knew what to ask for a child with Down syndrome. Most people said, oh, she's using a booster seat, that's just fine. We're really glad that's appropriate age for her. But I knew that that was eh, maybe not likely and got the actual truth from, from the mom. But that whole intervention then, that extra 10 to 15 minutes took me another, um, set my whole day off. 
So when, and I had good resources, I had not everyone has, um, has that available to them. And yet it set my whole clinic off for at least for the rest of the day, because I took what was important, that extra 10 to 15 minutes um, in an attempt to make that, um, uh, give the mother the right resources. So um, I don't know if that answers the question, but I gave you a little extra. <laughs> Great, thanks, Dr. Bull. Um, there, well, first off, I think a couple of topics uh, rise to the surface for future for future webinar discussions. Um, it looks like that there was a lot of interest in uh, the approval process for obtaining an adaptive restraint and writing the letter of medical necessity. So that might be something that we would want to consider for future um, and. Also, one of the other things that I did want to mention, and, and um, Dr. Ball, you might want to just address this quickly. There's a movement to moving uh, more toward using the term adaptive needs rather than special needs. Can you give a little explanation on that? Absolutely. That's a truly um, a hot topic at this point. And we're hearing nationally from above that um, using um, special needs is less desired. And yet when I talk to families and I've been, we're exploring this, they really don't understand adaptive needs. So it's a technician term and useful from a therapy standpoint. And I think it's a, um, it's a topic in progress. I mentioned to Marsha as we were preparing this that even the definition of children with special health care needs was published in 1998. So I my one of my in my spare time plan to do is go to the NIH and talk to them a little bit about um, updating all of this. So great question, limited answer. Okay. Um, I'm just looking through the comments. Um, Nicole, you had one that was very specific to a, a patient, and I think that one might be better addressed maybe in a conversation with, with Marsha or Dr. Bull. Um, let's see. I'm not seeing any other major questions here, just some comments about working with various patients. Um, Anthony is mentioning about the stack training. We should have probably done a survey at the beginning of the presentation to see how many have completed the Safe Travel for All Children training. There seems to be quite a bit of interest in those that are in the webinar wanting to attend. Uh, do, I'm not seeing any other major questions here. Do you, do, do one of you want to just quickly touch base on the letter of medical necessity? And just to click. Well, I can question. comment briefly. Tony is the expert. We have, um, it is a integral part of the stack training. So yes, letters of medical necessity are, um, essential for most um, third-party payer uh, approval to cover the cost. And examples for that are in the stack training. I'm not sure if they're on the preventinjury.org website. Can Marsha or Tony respond to that? I will double check. Tony says no letters of medical necessity are on the um, are on our website. So, um, and usually that's done through a um, therapist. So they're from that is that are familiar with the criteria required for it. But um, I'm gonna just offer Tony as a resource if you, um, if a therapist has a specific um, question. And again, take the stack course. <laughs> um, we, we do have a question in the Q&A from Megan and she asks, um, 
do you all have any information as to why the car seat industry has moved away from harness seats that went above 65 pounds? Um, I believe it has to do with having to pass the crash test using the 10 year old dummy. Is, is that correct? Do you have any more information to add on that, Marilyn? No, that's my understanding too, that they must meet the 213 standards um, for, for that dummy. And um, so that's a manufacturer by manufacturer um, situation. And yes, there are no currently approved seats that I'm aware of that are harnessed to over 65 pounds. Yeah, I think that they have to realistically assume that a 10 year old would fit in the harness. And I think those of us in the field realized that most of the harnesses, even in conventional seats that went beyond 65 pounds, that wasn't a, a reality that, that a 10 year old would have fit in it. Um, I saw someone ask the question about the American Academy of Pediatrics update for the um, product guide. And yes, that is done annually. It is a once a year. Um, we're continuing to encourage them to do that. It does have a unreimbursed cost, of course, to the American Academy of Pediatrics, but it is published typically in January with what the manufacturers have provided us. Okay, great. Uh, we have a poll launched just asking how many of you have completed the Safe Travel for All Children. And if you have not completed it, are you interested in taking it? If you could quickly give us an answer to that poll so we can share the answers. Uh, Just looking here to see if we have anything new. Here's a question from Kevi. How do you address the lack of resources in rural areas where we may not have a hospital or a lot of training for children needing a, an adaptive restraint? Any suggestions on that? So, Yes, that is a continuing challenge and the meeting the needs of the underserved is a major priority for us. We would encourage um, you to a expand the as, as, a, as wherever possible the trainees, but also um, know the resources across your state. Where is the closest place that you can identify a um, uh, the, the needs that your patient may have. And um, hopefully um, some of that, and I, and I know travel is an issue as well. So hybrid servicing is, is wherever possible I, ideal. And I don't know if Marsha wants to answer, respond to anything as well. But knowing what your state resources are to be able to refer is, is really important. Or even just a telephone consult can be very helpful. I also would encourage people to think about how um, you can work more collaboratively, collaboratively as a state team. So we may be launching something a little bit different next year for our state program, where we're able to do more virtual visits with a technician that maybe is in a more rural place and send them a car seat or in a, a restraint that may be appropriate and do a virtual visit, whether it's a ride safer vest or an easy on vest. I think the important part is it is, is bringing all of those people together, right? And that can sometimes be hard, especially if you are in a more rural community and you, you don't have those resources that you've connected with at a child passenger safety conference or at a technical update in your area, which can be challenging if you're a technician and you're the lone technician in your county. I think another way that you can really think about how you can best serve your community when you don't have access is think about the other organizations in your county. So your Head Start, your community service organizations, 
um, the Kiwanis, the, the other um, service organizations that may be able to give you some funding to purchase a ride safer vest. I know someone asked about a ride safer vest and I'm not endorsing a ride safer vest. It was just something that was we were able to be able to purchase, um, not endorse any of these products, but they have a 10 year expiration. So that that's something that um, was worth the investment for our program because we have really started to see, and I, and I think it may be due to COVID. And I know Dr. Bull and I have discussed this. We have some kids that haven't gotten some early intervention um, and maybe some misdiagnoses because of COVID and people have been scared to, to bring their kids in. Um, so we've missed out on some kids and, and they've been sitting at home and, and maybe missed out on some interventions that they really needed. A ride safer vest cannot be used on a school bus, no. Uh, Marsha, Anthony, Dr. Bull, have you been able to utilize any sort of um, uh, virtual sessions when working with children with special health care needs? So Tony is working on something right now, but I, I don't know if he wants to go off of mute and maybe share. I don't know if Jessica can unmute. This is something that he's working on. Working on it, hang on one second. Okay. So I'll just comment while they bring him up. Um, we do medical visits virtually. And I have to say, I always incorporate the same questions relevant to transportation safety in that visit because these kids are out in their vehicles, even if they're not traveling much. So um, we, we generate the issues and, and attempt to um, remind them about keeping rear facing longer and, and using um, booster seats till the seatbelt fits as best possible. So yes. And I'll just say in some of the families that uh, we've worked with um, and, uh, when we were setting up consults for children with, with uh, special needs was that it was very helpful to have an initial uh, conversation with the caregiver uh, via Zoom so that they could arrange for care for the child so that you had their undivided attention to be able to um, get the background information that was needed, and then also maybe to show them a couple of suggestions on what might be available. And then that led nicely into the in-person visit that we would do where we had some of the legwork done and we could look at, we could trial in, in certain restraints that we both agreed might be a good option. Anthony, you should be unmuted just to let yeah. everyone know. Okay, so my name is Anthony McGovern. I'm an OT at Riley Hospital and with the National Center. And we do virtual visits for traditional occupational therapy and other therapies. And the initial evaluation, just as Jim was saying, could work, but it's very challenging um, trying to take measurements or get parents to be able to take measurements depending on the need. Um, so I often call families and just talk on the phone and then we have the in-person visit and talk about the various restraints that might be helpful. It, I am going to trial delivering a, an adaptive restraint to a family in a week or two with one of the equipment companies, but I'm requiring that the equipment company rep be there to be the hands that I can't be because a lot of parents um, aren't able to adjust the, the adaptive seats or to add the um, the various accessories that might be coming with it. So I want um, some semi-skilled hands there to go through it. Ideally, we do this all in person where I could train them, point to it, show them, do exactly what they, what they need and different parents have different questions, but wanna make sure that this can, can work. So we're trialing it with one of the equipment companies around Indianapolis for a patient that lives almost to Chicago. So we're gonna try that in a week or two and hopefully it goes well. I can just see it taking a very long time because a lot of adjustments need to be made to make sure positioning is correct and installing um, is a whole world to itself, depending on the vehicle and the person installing it too. So it's possible, but I think it would be challenging. Sure, great. Thank you, Anthony. Um, and regarding the question on ride safe for travel bus vests on buses, we have uh, Vera Fullaway who's 
for safe traffic system joining us. And she says that the ride saver travel vest can be used on a school bus. Uh, and uh, Denise Donaldson with Ride Safe News mentioned too that there's also additional information on that in your latch manual. Again, one more reason that each technician should have a latch manual. Uh, here's one we might, well, we've just got a couple of minutes, but Dr. Bull, if you'd like to address this one, we have a nine year old uh, with a child with autism. Um, he is known to unbuckle his seatbelt. Uh, he is too tall and over the weight for a five point harness. Do you have any suggestions or recommendations? Well, the, the surefire recommendation, and, and I'll see if Tony has other thoughts as well, but is would be the easy on vest with a floor mount. Um, there is no access to the to the um, harness system for that child. They can't unbuckle their belts or get out if you use um, the the post uh, the back closure. So um, that's the one that I'm aware of. Tony, do you have others? Um, for the seatbelt in particular, that's probably the best. It goes up to 168 pounds with that floor mount. Um, NHTSA does not recommend the buckle covers or anything because it could uh, interact with the retraction of that seat in a crash situation. So I know a lot of families do that and some ABA centers give those out initially when they meet. So I've been trying to curb that a little bit. Um, but the Easy On Vest with the, the zipper in the back has some other options for those kids who might be unbuckling. Um, those that might still fit into adaptive car seats like the Roosevelt, which was just brought up. If they're fitting into that, the anti-escape options on that are pretty foolproof. Unless they have a tool of some sort, they won't be able to get out of that. And then you don't have to, the seatbelt isn't used, it's used for installation. And then the, there are a few other options for adaptive restraints with um, anti-escape options, but um, it just depends on the child and what would work best for them, their size, their weight, all of that, how they're unbuckling, because if they're unbuckling the seatbelt, then we have to work to maybe the easy on vest. But if they're unbuckling the, the harness, then there are options within the harness world in the adaptive car seat world. Great, thank you, Anthony. Uh, we just have a couple of slides here to wrap up. And uh, Tammy, can you quickly show us the results of the poll? And I apologize for those who might have had some difficulty. It looks like there might have been some difficulty in having to answer question two if you answer question one. Uh, but just showing that quite a few of our attendees have not completed the safe travel for all children, and quite a few are also interested in, in doing that. So thank you for taking that poll. Uh, closing remarks, we just want to remind you that the National Child Passenger Safety Awards are still open through August 31st. And uh, the CPS board every year will recognize a technician, an instructor, and a team of the year. And everyone is eligible. We do uh, encourage self-nominations as well. So please consider putting in your nominations for that before August 31st. Uh, we have a QR code right there if you'd like to scan it and answer the simple five or six questions to nominate your team. Uh, next slide. And just a reminder that the National Child Passenger Safety Board currently has three open member positions. One that coming open in uh, next year, 2023. The first one is child passenger safety advocate. The second one is child passenger safety advocate who works with at risk and underserved populations. And the third is for uh, is a, a representative of the vehicle manufacturers. And so if any of those are of interest to you, we do, we'd encourage you to apply. Again, we have the QR code there if you'd like more information on that. And next slide. And just a reminder that we do have uh, three more webinars coming up uh, this summer. The first one will be on 15 passenger vans. Uh, the second one, uh, Tech Guide 2.0, the deeper dive into the why, why 
why do we do what we do? Why are we involved in child passenger safety? And the third webinar will look at older vehicles titled Oldies But Goodies, CPS and Older Vehicles. And thank you for joining us today. Remember within a day or two, you should receive your certificate uh, for participating. And um, if you don't, we just ask you to reach out to uh, secretariat at cpsboard.org. Uh, Jess, our secretariat can help you with that. And with that, we'll wish you a happy rest of the day and thank you for joining us.